On October 4th, two hikers were walking through Big Tahunga Canyon in Angeles National Forest. It was a beautiful, sunny California day, and the duo trekked into the forest for recreation. As they approached the stream and looked up into the clearing, they could see sunshine beaming down through trees as birds sang overhead. It was blissfully peaceful. As they slowly panned their gaze down to the stream, the peace was shattered. There, laying in the stream, face down, was the cold, dead corpse of a high school girl. Michelle Avila was born in 1968 and grew up in Arletta, Los Angeles. She was a very happy and friendly child who seemed to thrive around friends and family. Because of her gregarious nature, she had many friends, but her best friend was a girl called Karen Severson. They were inseparable throughout junior school and they could be found spending time together almost every single day. As they grew older, as tends to happen in time, they entered high school and they grew apart a little bit. Missy, being the more outgoing of the two, became pretty popular and started to split her free time with her new friends and with Karen. As she grew older, the other kids started to consider Missy to be the pretty one, and soon after the interest from boys began to follow. As she started to spend more and more time with boys, she noticed that Karen had started to become distant and jealous. And they began to bicker and fight more until Missy spent almost no time with Karen. Perhaps because of being rejected by her friend or feeling jealous of all the attention she was getting or a combination of both, Karen started a rumour that her friend Missy was having sex with all the boys. Shortly after, a group of girls then beat up Missy, accusing her of sleeping with their boyfriends. Time marched on. And during high school junior year, Missy started dating a boy called Randy. They would date on and off for a month or so until Missy broke up with him because he was too much of a party boy. A few weeks after the breakup, her best friend Karen started dating Randy instead. Randy still frequented the many parties of high school. Only now, he took Karen as his date instead of Missy. At one such party, Karen wandered into a room to see Missy sitting on Randy's lap and told Missy's mother about the incident. What she didn't know, however, was that Missy had actually rejected Randy and left his company. If she'd stayed for just another five or ten minutes, she would have seen Missy literally pushing herself away from Randy. The following day, Missy told Karen about the incident and she told Karen to break up with Randy because he couldn't be trusted and she was worried that her friend would get hurt. Karen just assumed that Missy wanted Randy for herself and ignored her. On the 24th of September 1985, Missy and Karen were spotted in a local park, arguing. According to the witness, Karen had threatened Missy with a broken beer bottle until the altercation was stopped and the two girls were sent home. A few weeks later, on October 1st, Missy had told her mom that she was going out with her school friend Laura Doyle, who then picked her up in her car. Four hours later, Doyle called Missy's mom and asked to speak to Missy, at which point Missy's mom was pretty surprised because she thought that Missy was with Laura and said that Missy wasn't there. Doyle replied saying that she had dropped Missy off with three boys in a blue Camaro. Laura went to get some gas and when she came back, the boys and Missy were gone. Three days later, hikers stumbled across her body, face down in the stream. A four foot log had been placed on her back, preventing her from getting up. And her waist length hair had been hacked into a mess. Despite the altercation 10 days before her death, Mrs. Mom Irene and the police never really suspected Karen as a suspect because she attended the funeral and even moved in with Irene for a while to console her. She would also regularly visit Mrs. Grave and while Laura Doyle had technically been the last person to see her alive and 
should really have been a primary suspect, she wasn't for very similar reasons. She attended the funeral and she'd even given a condolences card to Irene with $20 inside of it. The police did try to follow up on Laura's lead regarding the three boys in the Blue Camaro, but they couldn't find the Blue Camaro and couldn't identify the boys. They couldn't even really establish that they ever existed in the first place. Three years later, the case went cold until July 26, 1988, when a teenager called Eva Chirambolo came forward and told a very chilling story to the police. A short time later, both Severson and Doyle were arrested and charged with first degree murder. After investigation, it was revealed that Karen had decorated the walls of her home with newspaper clippings of the murder investigation and she regularly visited the site of the murder. Chirambolo stated that she had been hiking in the forest and came across the girls arguing. The two perpetrators were accusing Missy of sleeping with their boyfriends, which Missy was vehemently denying before the girls got violent, grabbed her head, forced it under the water until her body convulsed as lungs filled with water. And then she went limp. At which point, the girls then cut Missy's hair and placed the log on her back to be 100% sure that she was dead. The case continued all the way until 1990, when in March of 1990, the jury delivered their verdict, guilty, of second degree murder. They rejected the uh, charge of first degree murder, as they weren't entirely convinced that the murder was planned in advance, even though, years later, during a failed parole hearing, Laura Doyle did admit that they had always intended to kill her. They reached sentence to 15 years to life in prison with Karen serving 21 and a half years and Laura 22 years. Upon release, Karen tried to sell the story to publishers and producers in Hollywood, which outraged Missy's family because they had no idea that the story of their daughter's death was being sold until reporters and researchers showed up at their door asking them questions. This led to them campaigning for a new law which would require anyone publishing or producing work based on real-life crimes to notify the victim's family first before proceeding. This was later enacted and called Missy's Law. That is the story of Missy Avila and the twisted friendship which led to her childhood best friend forcing her head under water until water filled her lungs and the life drained from her eyes. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.